Good afternoon to all. Uh, we welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. <laughs> I would now request uh, Professor Saumitra Banerjee, General Secretary of Breakthrough Science Society, also a professor at uh, the uh, ICER Calcutta, to preside over this function. Over to you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajivan. Uh, as you know, our organization, the Breakthrough Science Society, works for propagation of a scientific bent of mind among the people in general, and also uh, works towards popularization of science. And in that pursuit, in our country, whoever has played a role, uh, whenever we always respect them, and whenever such a person passes away, it has been our long-standing practice to <clears throat> pay respect and to commemorate their contribution. And we have done so for many people who have played an important role in propagation of a scientific bent of mind or in popularization of science. And in this case, uh, Professor Anu Padvanavan, a doyen in the area of science, as well as and popularization has passed away about a month back. And so we decided to pay respect to him. And who better would be the speaker to pay respect to him than Professor T.P. Singh. So we are really, it is a pleasure to have him uh, to speak on the contribution of Professor Padmanavan. But before we go on to his talk, let us have a brief presentation by uh, George Joseph on the contributions of Professor Tanu Padmanavan uh, in the area of popularization of science. Uh, I request Dr. Maravindana Dera of Aitar Mohali to introduce Mr. George Joseph. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Sri George Joseph. Sri George Joseph worked uh, as a senior scientific officer at the Radiological Safety Division of Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakkam, Tamil Nadu. He has retired and presently he is a member of the All India Secretariat Committee of Breakthrough Science Society. So with these words, I would like to request uh, Mr. George Joseph to start his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, you, Dr. Manavendra. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to share a few thoughts about the contributions of uh, Professor Tanupat Manaban in popularizing science in the country. As we all know, science is a great tool in the hands of mankind in uh, developing the material, <coughs> the spiritual condition or the social and cultural condition of the, of the society. Uh, when science at the time, uh, development of science and technology is uh, develops the material conditions, but it, at the same time, it's also important that uh, the scientific thought or scientific thinking percolates in society. Otherwise, uh, what uh, we will see is that, uh, say, like in our country, we send uh, probes to the uh, Mars or uh, moon, but at the same time we find a large section of our people steeped in uh, uh, superstitions like uh, astrology, etc. And uh, in this regard, uh, Professor Patnaban has made a great part in taking science to the people. In one of his interviews, he says that uh, taking scientific knowledge to the people is not that difficult, but creating a scientific outlook or scientific timber in the society or in the people. That's a pretty difficult task. So I'll just uh, go um, and share a few uh, slides on his uh, contributions. Uh, he has been a very prolific writer 
and uh, uh, he has uh, say more than 300 uh, popular science lectures and and around 100 popular science articles and if you go through some of his lectures so very lucid and even a very complex idea he tries to present in a way that even a layman can understand this habit uh, when he developed even from his uh, college days so he used to take classes for his own colleagues and also he was active in the say science uh, clubs and uh, other uh, popular, I mean, public uh, lectures, where even the complex ideas he could uh, convey in a very lucid manner. And after uh, uh, joining TFR, he was a regular contributor to the magazine, Science Today and Science Age, where he published, he used to publish uh, uh, things which were quite interesting to say, uh, common people like play themes, recreational mathematics, and then there was also a, a series of uh, uh, write-ups on milestones in science, in the history of science. And this history of science is another important aspect of uh, his contribution. Uh, generally, in our uh, school education or in the school textbooks, we find some equations and uh, some formulae and uh, uh, students are asked to solve it. But how those equations were developed, I mean, what type of struggle went into it, those things are generally not uh, presented to the students. So students do not develop that kind of an appreciation for uh, the way it was developed. You all know how the Boltzmann, uh, he developed a simple equation, but uh, what type of struggle he had to uh, put up and in fact, he had to give, give up his life also for that. This is the case for uh, many, uh, very many great scientists. They had to even uh, uh, give up their life for the uh, sake of truth, for the sake of life, I mean, sake of science. So unless we try, we try to know those uh, that struggle of their life struggle, we will not be able to really appreciate the uh, science behind a uh, science they have developed. Professor uh, <coughs> Patnaban has several, written several books, and particularly uh, for uh, like at the academic level, he wrote about ten books. Of course, I am not going to go into those. These some of those books have become textbooks in the universities around the world. At the popular level, he had uh, written a few books. One is after the first three minutes, the story of our universe, how the st present structure of our universe evolved in a very lucid manner, which uh, common people uh, can also understand. Generally, we, uh, when we uh, see textbooks on uh, cosmology, etc., you find a very uh, many, many jargons and uh, terminologies which are quite uh, uh, incomprehensible uh, uh, to the common people. But then uh, Patnafan uh, tries to give a very, uh, in a, in a very uh, a sense in a very understandable manner so that even common people get a grasp of things. Another is uh, the story of physics, and then the quantum themes, which is about uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, I'll come to those once, one by one, and the dawn, the dawn of science. Uh, the history of uh, science this is a comic serial uh, he started uh, in the 1980s so felt that it was i mean in those days comics were popular so <coughs> to uh, to bring the attention 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 of the students and the younger generation so he tried to uh, i mean uh, so he wrote a series of uh, uh, articles in the form of cartoons, I mean, cartoon stories on the story of physics. This was published by Gyan Prasar uh, in 2002 as a book and was translated into several languages. Uh, this is a very classic book of uh, Professor Patmanaban, of course, uh, this is a joint collaboration of uh, his uh, wife, Dr. Vasandi Patmanaban, 
uh, he admits that uh, Professor Pakhtavath Vasandi has made the, the major contribution in this. This was uh, uh, initially this was published as a series of articles in uh, Science Today. And when Science Today was wound up, it was then he published as a 24 part article uh, serial in the uh, Science Journal Resonance in uh, Indian Academy of Science, uh, Journal of the uh, Indian Academy of Sciences. So here, this book, uh, he has uh, I mean, brought about uh, the history of science in a very uh, comprehensive manner, starting from the very beginning. And this is a very, uh, the learning the history of science is a very important aspect in the learning, I mean, in uh, uh, developing a good understanding of science. So he has realized this uh, even the, at the very uh, early stage of his uh, career. And he has uh, devoted, and he, not only he, uh, Dr. Vasandi has uh, made a great uh, effort in uh, bringing out this uh, book. It was uh, published in 2019 as a book. This is a picture of uh, Dr. Vasandi and uh, uh, enjoying the reading of the book. Uh, this is another uh, very interesting book on quantum themes. Uh, generally, quantum mechanics is something which is really not uh, easily comprehensible uh, because of its uh, complexity. <laughs> But then uh, Professor Patnaban has tried to uh, bring about, bring the essence of uh, uh, quantum mechanics in a way which is uh, quite understandable to, uh, say, students with a uh, plus two level uh, understanding of mathematics and physics. <coughs> this is another, uh, this I already have said that this is a book uh, initially he published in the eight, uh, this was published in 1998. Uh, this is a brief <coughs> introduction to how uh, our universe, uh, the stru person structures of the universe has evolved. And it's also a very I mean, interesting book, which gives a good understanding of how our universe uh, evolves. This way, when he has been a, a very, uh, very serious effort in uh, taking science to the people and to popularize science and uh, his lectures, if you go through, they are all uh, been very, very uh, uh, lucid as well as uh, the, even the complex uh, terminologies he tries to avoid and try to <coughs> make it understandable to the common people. And this, he has, uh, he has <coughs> It is his uh, uh, commitment that in uh, we take science to the people, unless the scientific uh, outlook, uh, a good scientific outlook develops in the people, the society also will remain backward. So with this, I will just conclude. He remained committed to the responsibility of scientists towards society and continue to be very active in public outreach uh, programs. With this, I conclude. I pay my uh, respects to Professor Tanam Patmanaban for his uh, very, very <coughs> tiring and uh, indefat defat very consistent effort in uh, popularizing and uh, science. Thank you all. Thank you, George. Sir. Well, now we have the main presentation by <coughs> Professor T. E. Singh. And I would request Dr. Manavindranath Bera of Aitan Mohali to introduce Dr. T. Singh. Uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. So, once again, uh, let me take the privilege to introduce our main speaker of the day, Professor Tejinder Pal Singh.
Professor Singh did his PhD from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, in the year 1989. He was a postdoctoral fellow at ICTP Trieste, Italy, during the period 1989 to 1990, before joining TIFR, that is this Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, where he is currently a professor at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. His main research areas are quantum gravity and cosmology. He is working on quantum measurement problem and foundation of quantum mechanics, gravitational <coughs> theories uh, with torsion, origin of cosmic acceleration and dark energy, cosmological constant problem and the large scale structure of the universe and gravitational collapse and cosmic censorship. Professor T.P. Singh has received several awards and honors, including the awards from the Gravity Research Foundation. He has also served as the guest editor of Current Science Special Issue on 100 years of general relativity. And also as a member of Council of the Indian Association for General Relativity and Gravitation. He has published more than 100 research papers in reputed international journals and also has delivered talks in many international conferences, especially in the areas of quantum gravity and general relativity. Apart from his research and academic activities, Professor T.P. Singh is also actively involved in popularization of science. He has delivered many popular science lectures including some lecture series on YouTube. He, he was also a member of Science Popularization and Public Outreach Committee at TIFR. So with these few words, I would like to request Professor T.P. Singh to start his webinar. Over to you, Professor Singh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your very kind introduction. I would like to thank uh, the Breakthrough Science Society for giving me this opportunity. I thank you all for coming today. We are here to celebrate the work of uh, Professor Thanu Padmanabhan and the title of the talk is Gravitation from Newton to Padmanabhan and Beyond. So what did Professor Padmanabhan show about gravity? He showed that gravity is an emergent thermodynamic phenomenon. I'll explain these two words as we go along, emergent and thermodynamic. So thermodynamic means obeys the laws of thermodynamics. Emergent means there is something more fundamental from which this is coming out in some sense as an approximation, there is something deeper than gravity. That is what emergent means. So he showed in a very convincing way that gravity is an emergent thermodynamic phenomenon. In the same way that water, for example, is an emergent thermodynamic phenomenon. Water, as we know, is not a fundamental uh, entity. It is made up of molecules of water. The properties of water are dictated by its molecules. Same way, uh, the property of gravity is dictated by what we call atoms of space-time. This was a term coined by uh, Padmanabhan when he showed that gravity is not fundamental but uh, derivable from something deeper. Uh, that deeper thing of which it is made, he called atoms of space-time. So in my talk today, I would like to explain to you uh, the history of gravitation and uh, how did Professor Padmanabhan come to this point? Uh, and we go back to the very beginning of uh, how we learned about gravity and then we come to uh, how uh, Vajanavan came to this uh, uh, conclusion from his research and what it implies for future work on gravity and quantum gravity. How did we get here? Our story must begin 
with the, something which you can call the mystery of the wanderers. So, who were the wanderers? What were the wanderers? Uh, let's start from how ancient man, let's say, all the way through history up to the time of Greeks. How do we? How do we look? How did we look at the universe in the past? This was our universe. This was our cosmology. Every morning, the sun rises in the east. It uh, sets in the west, and uh, it looks like it is going around the earth. The earth is uh, static, and the sun is going around the earth. And when the sun sets, you see this uh, dome of stars in the sky with the successive stars rising in the east and setting in the west, just like the sun does, as if this dome of stars is going around the earth and uh, hence making us believe that the earth is the center of the universe and everything goes uh, around the earth. Same uh, is true apparently for the moon and of course the moon we know does go around the earth. So this was the universe of man, uh, say, few, till about few thousand years ago. The sun seems to go around the earth, the moon seems to go around the earth, and the dome of stars which we see every night after sunset also goes around the earth. Uh, this would have been fine, except that there was a problem. The orbits of planets. There are five objects in the sky, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, which did not obey this good habit of going around the Earth. So here is an example uh, of a recent uh, picture, uh, which uh, su takes successive positions of a planet. One of these starts here, goes, 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 goes. It's so far so good, but then it turns back. It that and then it comes back and loops and it goes again. This does not look like this object is going around the earth. So that was a problem. That was the most important and serious problem of cosmology uh, 2000 years ago at the time of the Greeks. Why do these five planets behave in such an erratic way? What is responsible for their motion? Why are they not going around the Earth? So uh, people came up with the theories. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said, see, the Earth is stationary. If it was moving, you would see the wind moving in the opposite direction. There would be a gush of wind. And if you throw a ball up, by the time it comes down, the Earth would have moved. So the ball should fall behind you. But it falls uh, right back to you if you throw it up. So the earth cannot move. The sun, the moon, the dome of stars all go around the earth. And the planets also, he said, go around the earth. But we do not understand uh, why we do that. So as you know, Ptolemy came up with these circles, inside circles, inside circles, uh, basically showing that the motion of planets does take place around the earth and is a combination of various circular motions, which sometimes hence look uh, erratic. And the circle was very important. It was the most perfect uh, shape in geometry. And it was believed that these heavenly bodies go around the Earth in uh, circular orbits. And as you know, a few hundred years ago, things began to change all this period 1500 years since the Greeks, there was a, there was a secondary theory that no, it is the earth which goes around the sun and the planets go around the sun or some mix of the Aristotle Ptolemy school and the uh, heliocentric schools. But the prevalent, the dominant school was the Aristotle school that the earth is at the center of the universe. And uh, in 1515, Copernicus gave this model of the universe, uh, the hypothesis that the Earth is indeed a planet like Venus or Saturn, and all the planets revolve around the sun. Uh, so this was uh, Copernicus' 
the Copernicus picture of the universe. Uh, the sun is at the center, and uh, at a very far off distance, there is an immobile sphere of the fixed stars. Then there is the orb orbit of Saturn, then the orbit of Jupiter, the orbit of Mars. Uh, this is the orbit of uh, uh, the then the orbit of the Earth with the Moon going around the Earth. And inside that, uh, Venus and uh, Mercury. This was the beginning of the Copernican revolution, but it was, of course, not overnight. It uh, took from 1515 all the way up to Newton's uh, book, Principia Mathematica, 1687, before the geocentric view was uh, overthrown. Another 150 years was the duration of this uh, revolution. As in all of physics, uh, old theories get overthrown if some important experiment uh, disagrees with them. And that is what happened when Galileo invented the telescope. In 1610, he looked at the moons of Jupiter uh, there were these four, uh, what are now called Galilean moons, which it was clear were going around Jupiter and not uh, around the Earth. So that was the first convincing experiment that there are things which do not uh, go around the Earth, and those are the moons of Jupiter. And then, of course, Galileo also observed the phases of Venus, and that uh, for once and for all established that uh, Venus goes around the sun because only then can such phases uh, arise depending on which part of Venus is getting lit by the sun. The next important development came from the work of Kepler, who used Tycho Brahe's data to actually try to figure out that if Mars goes around the sun, what is its orbit? What is the shape of the orbit? It was expected to be a circle because there's the most perfect of shapes. So Kepler tries, tried very hard to show using Brahe's data that Mars goes around the sun in a circular orbit. But uh, then, uh, of course, you know this is history. One of the greatest piece of experimental and observational works where Kepler showed the that the orbit of Mars around the sun is not a circle, but an ellipse like this with sun at one of the focus, and the planet goes around the sun in an elliptical orbit. Uh, Kepler also uh, showed uh, by looking at the orbits of uh, other planets that uh, this distance from the sun uh, is uh, very precisely related in a mathematical way to the time that the planet takes to go around the sun. So the time to taken to go around and this distance are related. That is the so-called relation where the square of the time of orbit is uh, proportional to the cube of uh, this distance. T square by R cube is a constant. That is one of Kepler's laws. And that was the main motivation, mathematical motivation for Newton, a hint. Uh, he had to prove from his theory, when we come to Newton, that uh, this particular mathematical relation should be obeyed. T squared should be proportional to R cube. And the orbits should come out to be elliptical and not circular. So by the time of Galileo and Kepler, the view that the sun goes around the earth is more or less uh, dead because of these experimental observations. And then it is left to Newton, the greatest physicist of all times, to develop a mathematical theory to explain the final, solve the mystery of this erratic motion of the planets. You know, one and a half thousand years from Aristotle to Newton, that is of, of what how long it took to understand uh, gravitation. So Newton says, to the same natural effects 
we must as far as possible assign the same causes. Very beautiful, you see, that the cause that makes things fall to the earth must be the same cause which causes planets to go around us. And such a big, big leap in of thought and philosophy that uh, uh, as far as possible, we should have identical reasons for things to move irrespective of whether they are near us or far from us. So by unifying all motion, Newton shifted the scientific perspective to a search for large unifying patterns in nature. The birth of modern physics, we are, I mean, we are all really, all physicists are Newton's children. We are, to my mind, generalizing Newton's work. That's what we are still doing. So before the law of gravitation, Newton gave us the laws of motion. Firstly, every body perseveres in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed there. And this is the language from Principia, old style, uh, old style uh, English. Namely, if a body is at rest, it will stay there. If it is moving in a straight line with a uniform, with a fixed speed, it will keep going at that speed. To change this state of motion, uh, you need to apply forces. And uh, what is the law of forces? This, uh, of course, is Newton's second law of motion. The alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. So Newton gives us the laws of motion a uh, very famous second law, force is mass times acceleration. If a body has a mass m, the acceleration that it will experience will depend on the force applied. So this is the beginning of uh, modern physics, Newton's uh, laws of motion. And in particular, he figured out what should be the nature of the force which makes the uh, uh, the apple fall to the earth or uh, the planets to go around the sun. Before we go on to the law of gravitation, uh, there is something important about Newton's laws of motion, which we will keep in mind because we we'll need it in a few minutes. And that is the law of addition of velocities. A uh, very simple, we are used to it, uh, that velocities must add. Here is a train which is moving to the left at 40 miles per hour. In the train, there is a person who's going towards the engine at 10 miles per hour. What is the speed of this person with respect to someone who's standing at the rail railway platform and watching this person go ahead? So clearly, 10 miles per hour is his own speed with respect to the train. 40 is the speed of the train, so to find out the man, the walker's speed with respect to the stationary observer, we just add these two, 40 plus 10, 50. So speeds add, of course, with opposite direction, speed will subtract. But uh, this is important to remember because uh, it will play a role uh, in our understanding of uh, gravitation. Okay, so we have Newton's laws of motion. Uh, let us proceed further. Uh, what is the law of gravitation? All matter exerts a force called gravity that pulls all other matter towards its center. Very clear. The sun is pulling the earth by the gravitational force. The earth is also pulling the sun by a gravitational force. The strength of the force is proportional to the mass of the pulling object and proportional also to the mass of the object being uh, pulled. In other words, and the strength of the force falls inversely as the square of the distance between the bodies. The heavier the bodies, the more the force, the farther they are, the less the force. And this is the mathematical expression for Newton's law, famous law of gravitation. This is when we say 
the law of gravitation was born in 1687. Uh, if the force between the sun and the earth is m sun, mass of the sun, multiplied by mass of the earth, divided by the square of the distance between them. And here is the constant of proportionality, Newton's gravitational constant. Okay, so if you want to find out the acceleration of the earth as a result of this force applied by the sun on the earth, you can just put this in Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration and force also the gravitational force is given by this expression. So you can see if you want to find the acceleration of the earth, all you have to do is cancel the mass of the earth from both sides and the acceleration of the earth is just minus gm sun by r square using this law of motion newton showed that the orbit of the earth and the other planets around the sun is the elliptical he also derived kepler's other law about the time taken to go around being related to the distance from the sun so all is good Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, and Kepler uh, set the stage for Newton to um, uh, start um, modern physics. So, see, it is this erratic motion of the planets which is the birth of uh, modern physics. Newton invented the laws of motion and the mathematics of calculus precisely to be able to explain Precisely to be able to explain uh, why planets move in such a strange way. So the law of gravitation, Newton's law of gravitation and Newton's laws of motion are born here. And it uh, took him uh, something like 16 years to develop this whole uh, work when he was just 24. That the famous story, the apple fell on his head and uh, he realized that the same force must be making the planets go around the sun. But to complete the full mathematics, it took him 16 years and uh, his famous book, Principia Mathematica came out when he was uh, 40 years old. And uh, uh, as if uh, to support Newton, just uh, before the book came out in 1681 and 1682, there uh, was a comet uh, uh, visible uh, and uh, Newton showed using his laws of motion that the orbit of the comet, uh, because it is uh, not a bound orbit, it's, it's not ellipse, it is a parabola, but this is consistent with his laws of motion and his laws of gravity. So there was a live demonstration of the success of his laws while he was uh, formulating. Okay, so now we go to the next stage beyond uh, Newton. We are moving towards Einstein, Hawking, Penrose, and then we'll come to Padmanabha. Newton's law of motion and his law of gravitation stayed unchallenged for more than 200 years until physicists finally understood the phenomenon of light. Newton also studied light, but uh, uh, the clarity, the clear physics of how light behaves and what it is uh, came from the work of uh, Maxwell, Faraday and others around uh, the late part of 1800, 1880, 1870 and all the way up to 1905 when Einstein discovered special relativity. A uh, light is, as we know, is an electromagnetic wave. What is important for us is the fact about the speed of light. Let us go back to this picture, which I reminded you about. Uh, how to add velocities. So Newton, was, it is okay with the time for Newton. It was 10 plus 40, it's 50. So the speed of this man with respect to the person on the ground is 50 miles per hour. Now do one thing, replace this person by a beam of light. Let us say he has a torch in his hand and he shines a beam of light towards the engine 
and light moves very fast. As you know, its speed had been measured. The speed of the light with respect to the train is a huge number, 670 million miles per hour. So light is moving at this big speed in the forward direction. You ask this question now, how much is the speed of light with respect to the person standing on the ground? If we apply Newton's mechanics, it will be 670 million plus 40. But uh, when people did experiments to find out uh, whether this is true, they were in for a surprise. The person standing on the ground measures the same speed of light. Not, this 40 doesn't get added. The speed of light as seen by the person on the train and as seen by the person standing on the platform are the same, which means that Newton's law of addition of velocities does not apply to light. What does that imply? We have to give up Newton. At least for fast moving objects like light, Newton's laws of mechanics no longer hold because, again, you see, an, an experiment has overthrown Newton. First, Galileo and Kepler's experiments overthrew Aristotle. Then there comes along, along another experiment which measures the speed of light for different frames of reference, finds that the speed is the same for everyone. So Newton fails when it comes to light. So Einstein in, uh, invented special relativity to solve this problem of light, and he showed that uh, if two bodies are, if this per light, or if anyone has a speed V1, suppose this walker is moving very fast at a speed V1, you add to it the speed of the train. You want to find out the speed V of uh, this person with respect to the person on the ground. So you should do V1 plus V2 over 1 plus V1 V2 by C square, where C is the speed of light. Uh, you can easily check if V1 and V2 are both very small compared to the speed of light. This can be dropped. You only have one in the denominator. And lo and behold, you get back Newton's relation V equals V1 plus V2. Okay, which is very good. We conclude if things are moving at speeds much smaller than the speed of light, Newton's mechanics holds. But if things start moving very fast, approaching the speed of light, Newton's mechanics fails and we have to replace it by new laws of motion, the Einstein's laws of special relativity discovered by Einstein and other physicists in 1905. Also, nothing moved faster than the speed of light. There was no such restriction in Newton's mechanics. Things can move even infinitely fast, but now that is no longer possible. And nothing moves faster than this much. And the law of addition of velocities is such that the speed of light is the same for everyone. You can check. Suppose you put V2 equals speed of light. You can check in here that V will also be equal to C. This formula is invented precisely in such a way that the speed of light is the same in the train and for the person on the platform. So this is the first big change after Newton, after 200 years. Newton's laws of motion become an approximation to Einstein's laws of motion as given by the theory of special relativity. What does that do for gravitation? We'll come to that in a minute. So as I said, special relativity generalizes Newton's laws of motion. So that speed of light is the same for all observers. Space and time are no longer separately absolute. In Newton's view of the world, space and time are, have nothing to do with it. Both are absolute givens uh, according to uh, Newton's worldview, but in Einstein's theory, 
space and time get related to each other. Space time becomes uh, absolute, but space intervals and time intervals mix with each other. Moreover, uh, there is now a maximum speed allowed for anything. So, you know, in Newton's law of gravitation, if the sun were to move a little bit, its impact, the impact on Earth will be felt instantaneously. Even though the sun is very far, if the sun were to move, we say this action at a distance, instantaneous action at a distance. So if the sun moves, immediately the earth will be affected. But now in special relativity, this is not allowed. Why? Because we know that light takes about eight minutes to move from the sun to the uh, to come from sun to earth. So if the sun were to move, the effect on the earth cannot be felt faster than how much time light will take to travel because the signal has to, the influence has to reach the earth at a finite speed. So action at a distance is no longer allowed. So if Newton's laws of motion are replaced by Einstein's laws of special relativity, so that speed of light is same for everyone. We have no choice but to also modify Newton's law of gravitation. So I hope you get the picture. If you change Newton's laws of motion, you must also change his law of gravitation in such a way that it respects special relativity. Uh, nothing should move faster than light. Sun should not influence the earth instantly. So that also was left to Einstein. Uh, he showed that he generalized Newton's law of gravitation to a new theory of gravitation, which is given this name, the general theory of relativity. It is really a law, a new law of gravitation. And uh, what, what is the physics? What is the sense? It's very nice. Uh, if you remember, I showed you in a formula, if the acceleration of a body in a gravitational field is independent of its mass. Now we remember Galileo's famous experiment from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You throw down a, a stone and you throw down a feather. If uh, there is no resistance, if air was not there, they both reach the ground at the same time. Heavy bodies and light bodies all fall in a gravitational field with the same acceleration. This is very surprising. It's not in general to you because, for example, you apply a force on a football, you kick a football, it will go quickly, it will go very far. With the same force, you kick a cupboard, your foot will get hurt, the cupboard will not go anywhere. The acceleration of the cupboard is different from the acceleration of the football, whereas that is not true for gravity. Okay. Under the pull of the sun, uh, the motion of the earth and the motion of the Mars are both independent of their masses. And Newton knew this. Galileo and Newton, of course, knew this, that the acceleration is independent of the mass of the body being pulled. But uh, Einstein realized its importance. The fact that the acceleration of a body in a gravitational field does not depend on its mass led Einstein to conclude that gravity is not a force it is the curving of space-time. Uh, this you probably have heard. This is a famous thought experiment due to Einstein that if you are freely falling in a lift, in an elevator, in a gravitational field, uh, the physics inside the elevator is the same as if you were not in a gravitational field, but in a frame which was accelerating upwards in the opposite direction. So uh, you are falling in a lift, 
or you are staying there and the accelerating frame is moving upward, you will not know. You will not know the difference whether you are in an accelerating frame moving upwards or whether you are freely falling under uh, gravity. You will not be able to uh, tell the difference between the two cases. A consequence of that is that uh, you need not think of gravity as a force, but rather that uh, the presence of the sun uh, make the space around it curved in the sense uh, that, for example, the surface of, a, of the, the surface of a football is curved, whereas the surface of a plane is flat. Uh, geometric properties on curved surfaces are different from geometric properties on flat surfaces, and it is a beautiful uh, result due to Einstein that gravitation need not be thought of as a, as a force as Newton did. It can be thought of instead that the presence of heavy bodies curves the space and space-time around. So we now have a new theory of gravitation due to Einstein, 1916. He gave us the law of gravitation, and this law is consistent with special relativity. In Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, nothing moves faster than light. You cannot have action at a distance. So Einstein generalized Newton's law of gravitation in such a way that Newton's law became a special case for things which are not moving very fast. The law of general relativity reduces to Newton's law of gravitation. So let us recall where have we come? We have come from Aristotle, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton's law of gravitation. 200 years later, we learn that uh, the speed of light does not obey Newton's laws of mechanics, so special relativity is born, general relativity is born, and we start thinking of gravity as the curvature of space-time. Okay, this is around 1915, and now let us uh, uh, come more towards modern times. Ah, so, I will focus now on the part of Einstein's theory of gravitation, which concerns us most in the context of Padmanabhan's achievement. And unlike Newton's law of gravitation, general relativity predicts the existence of objects known as black holes. A black hole is a region of space-time from which nothing can escape, not even light. So uh, we believe that very massive stars at the end of their lives, when they're finished burning all their nuclear fuel, they become black holes, namely regions from which nothing can uh, escape. This is the consequence of the laws of general relativity, that even though light moves so fast, it cannot escape a uh, black hole. And we know black holes have been proven to exist. The LIGO gravitational wave detector has detected gravitational waves resulting from the merger of uh, two black holes. What theorists showed uh, while studying Einstein's theory of gravitation, that in any process involving black holes, the total surface area of the black holes never decreases. So think of a black hole as a spherical region, a sphere from inside which light cannot escape. So suppose a black hole has an area A1, another black hole has an area A2. If these were to merge to form a third black hole with an area A3, the resulting area can never be less than A1 plus A2. The, so as time grows, as the universe evolves, if black holes were to merge, their area will always uh, increase. Now this is very strange uh, 
from the point of view of a theory like gravitation. Newton's laws of motion, Newton's law of gravitation, even Einstein's law of gravitation are what we call time reversible. They are not sensitive to the direction of time. They are mechanical theories. Whatever law holds going forwards also holds going backwards in time. But here is one object, this black hole, whose area behaves in a very strange way. Area can never, can never decrease as time goes on, which means you have something like a direction of time. We had never put a direction of time in general relativity or in Newtonian mechanics or in special relativity. So where has this direction of time come from? So around 1960s onwards, physicists started realizing that the area of a black hole behaves like thermodynamic entropy. Now entropy is a measure of disorder. The entropy of the universe uh, always increases and it seems to be the case that the area, area of the black hole is the area of its surface, surface area. It seems to be the case that the area of the black hole is behaving like an entropy. And the black hole is a thermodynamic object. In fact, it was shown that uh, if you apply the rules of quantum mechanics, black holes are not entirely black. They emit radiation. They are hot. They have a temperature. They have a temperature and the area of a black hole behaves like entropy. In fact, what physicists showed that uh, if a black hole has a temperature, it also has an a entropy which is proportional to its area. So now we come to this very beautiful aspect of Einstein's theory of gravitation and which is not there in Newtonian gravitation, namely that there are these objects, black holes, which are behaving in a way like water. So this is the first introduction to water, uh, which I said in the very beginning of the talk in Padmanabhan's work, that this is behaving like a fluid or a thermodynamic object. Like for example, uh, if you, you know, if you light the gas below a pot of water, the water heats up. That is, and why does it heat up? Because it is made up of molecules of water, which start uh, moving around much more rapidly when heated. And then the energy of motion of those molecules is the heat that the water has absorbed and become hotter. That is what we mean by saying that water is a thermodynamic object. So if a black hole also has a temperature and is not exactly black, and if it has an entropy, what are the molecules of the black hole? I hope you get this picture. Uh, for a far away observer, you, black hole has only three uh, attributes. It's mass, its electric charge and the angular moment, the speed at which a black hole rotates. A black hole can rotate, it can have an electric charge and it can have a mass. So it has only three attributes, mass, charge and spin. Yet it is behaving like water, it has a temperature, it has an entropy. What are the molecules inside? What are these so-called atoms of space-time? What is their physics? How We are now not talking of atoms of the star which became a black hole. Those have already shrunk to the center and formed an infinite curvature singularity. No, we are now talking purely about the gravitation of the black hole. It is the gravitational aspect of the black hole which has a temperature, which has an entropy. So we now come to the conclusion that gravitation cannot be a fundamental force. It cannot even be curvature. A curvature description of gravitation is also approximate. It is not fundamental. Why? Because black holes are 
behaving like thermodynamic objects. They are behaving like water. This is the story that Professor Padmanabhan carried to a logical conclusion, which is the work for which he will always be remembered. Now I tell you, for, I call him Paddy. He was my, I was his PhD student at TIFR. So uh, we all call him Paddy. So uh, let me tell you a bit about his life story and then about what did he do uh, for, to this result of general relativity and black hole thermodynamics. So Paddy was born in Trivandrum in 1957 in a low income family with very gifted parents. Father was a very talented uh, mathematician who unfortunately could not become a mathematician because he had to support his family. And there were gifted uncles in the family who were mathematicians. And that helped him develop a serious early interest in mathematics and chess. He remained interested in chess all his life. And uh, in fact, uh, has sometimes written that he, he regrets he could not become a chess player. And then uh, in junior college, he came across the famous Feynman lectures on physics. He uh, came in touch with what is known as the Trivandrum Science Society, where he met other very bright and serious students interested in science. He won the National Science Talent uh, Scholarship. And uh, he came across this beautiful book by Misner, Thorn, and Wheeler called Gravitation. And he, so to say, fell in love with everything to do with gravity, he decided he will become a researcher on the subject of gravitation. He wrote his first research paper on gravity at the age of 20 in 1977. And even while doing his MSc, he was already noticed by scientists in India as well as abroad as being someone very, very special and outstanding. In 1979, Paddy joined the TIFR for his uh, PhD research with Professor Jan Narlikar. And the very next, it became clear that this was someone, you know, very special, very outstanding. He's just, you know, what, 22 years old. Very next year, they, they gave him a permanent job as a faculty member of TIFR uh, because he was so gifted. In 19, this is even before completing his PhD. In 83, he finished his research work with the Professor Nardikar. He was in Cambridge as a postdoctoral fellow for one year. And already the research in press is in related to gravity, quantum gravity, cosmology, the quest to understand uh, gravitation in the deepest way possible. And as we heard uh, from uh, Dr. Joseph, he was an outstanding teacher, a prolific author of great books, both technical and uh, popular, including a very famous and successful text on gravitation. He wrote a book on gravitation some years ago, and it is called Gravitation Foundations and Frontiers. It's a beautiful book and uh, very thought provoking. I recommend you to read it if you are interested in uh, gravitation. In uh, 92, uh, Paddy moved to Pune to the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, which is where he did this, uh, his famous uh, work on what we could ask, what is the true nature of gravity? So he is uh, thinking deeply about this question that why are black holes behaving like uh, thermodynamic objects? And is it a property only of the gravitation of black holes? Or is it a property of gravity in general? Like there is, you know, there is gravity in this room, but there is no black hole. So is the gravity in this room also behaving in a thermodynamic way, and that is his great contribution. He 
took Einstein's law of gravity in general, not just for the black hole case, and showed that the equations of general relativity can be written as if they are the law of thermodynamics. If you know some bit of physics, uh, T is the temperature of a body, dS is the change in its entropy, TdS gives the heat absorbed by the body, which is equal to the rate, the, the change in the internal energy of the body and the work done, one example of which is change in volume by application of a pressure. What Padmanabhan showed, and I'll say a little bit more about this, that the law of gravitation itself can be written as if it is a law of thermodynamics. The equations of gravity are this, take the form of uh, the equations of thermodynamics. And if you have done that, you have no choice but to accept that gravity in general is a thermodynamic phenomenon like water. It's, even the concept of curvature is approximate. What is most fundamental is that gravity is made up of what we call now atoms of space-time. I come back to this. There is, there is something microscopic about gravity, which is not conveyed just by calling it the curvature of space. This, this is his contribution. <clears throat> so uh, he goes deeper into this. Uh, why, why do black holes behave thermodynamically? And the reason for that is that precisely because nothing can escape from inside a black hole, a black hole has a horizon. Just as if you stand on the seashore, you cannot see beyond a point which where the sea seems to have an edge. That is the horizon. You cannot see beyond. Same way, you know, if you are looking at a black hole from far, you cannot see its inside. There is a horizon beyond which you cannot see. Anything which is beyond is, has, is information. There definitely is something inside the black hole. That is the information inside the black hole, which you cannot access. Loss of information is the same thing in physics as entropy or disorder. If you don't know something, then that is the same thing as saying that thing has an entropy. Entropy is a measure of ignorance. So because we do not see the inside of black holes, black holes have an entropy and consequently also a temperature. Independent of black hole, there is another very important a result in gravitation, uh, which is came, which was around the 1970s, just after black hole thermodynamics. That suppose you are a uniformly accelerating observer, uh, like suppose you are sitting in a train, and the train has a uniform acceleration given by a. It can be shown easily that again such an observer has a horizon. A uniformly accelerating observer, even in flat, ordinary space-time, where there is no gravity, has a horizon, cannot see till infinity, has a, has a limitation beyond which space-time cannot be seen. And lo and behold, it was shown that such space-times also have a temperature. Black holes are just a special case in general. An accelerating observer would also detect space-time to have a temperature given by this beautiful formula. A is the acceleration of the train of the observer, H is Planck's constant, C is speed of light, and K Boltzmann is the Boltzmann constant. Of course, this temperature is very, very small for normal acceleration. It is about a millionth of uh, Kelvin. That's why we don't see it. But let us remember that black holes are not the only things which have entropy and temperature. Space-time in general, in particular an accelerated observer, which you remember is from Einstein's observation on the elevator. A uniformly accelerating observer is equivalent to a uniform gravitational field and that 
will have a temperature and an accompanying entropy. It is this fact that not only black holes, but space-time surfaces in general have temperature entropy. This is what Cosmon Raven used to show that the equations of general relativity are thermodynamic equations. They are not fundamental. Gravitation is like water. And hence, we must try to understand what are the molecules or atoms of space. Time. Space time and gravity are one and the same thing, but they seem to have an internal structure. And now this has very important consequences. This kind of a result that gravitation is a thermodynamic phenomenon has implications for quantum gravity. This is an unsolved problem how to put quantum theory and general relativity together. People have been trying for a hundred years to quantize gravity. But if gravity is an emergent phenomenon, you don't quantize it. For example, you don't quantize water. You quantize the motion of molecules of water. The fundamental degrees of freedom have to be applied quantum theory to. So this result tells us at first we must find out what are the atoms of space-time, and then we must apply quantum theory to it. And the reason why we have not found a quantum theory of gravity is precisely because we are doing something incorrect. The Paris shows us that gravity is actually thermodynamic. You don't quantize the thermodynamics, you quantize the underlying atoms or molecules. That is the significance of his results. So if you build a picture, Aristotle, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Einstein, Hawking, Penrose. Now you come to, you see Paddy's contribution. It takes us to the next level. So where have we come in our understanding of gravity? We have come very far and yet we are not, uh, we are not done. Now we have to understand what are those atoms? What are those underlying degrees of freedom? So I have just one or two more slides and then I will end. This is the beyond part, Newton to Padmanabhan and beyond. Unfortunately, Paddy left us. Uh, he's not here to witness these developments now when we are trying to understand what are these atoms. So uh, it so happens that this is precisely the work I do. Uh, I grew up in Paddy's uh, uh, tutor, tutor teaching. I mean, I owe everything to him, really, my education, my training, my physics worldview. So I have been working on this question. Now, what are those underlying atoms of space-time? And uh, from my point of view, they are actually atoms of space-time matter. We do not, when we, when we try to ask for atoms of space-time, We do not any longer make a distinction between space-time and matter. In comes quantum theory. Quantum theory is a greatly successful theory of the microscopic world of atoms and elementary particles that you know. These elementary particles are living in space-time. But space-time is an emergent phenomenon. Space-time is the same as gravitation. The Paddy shows us that gravitation is an emergent phenomenon. That means there is an underlying situation when there is no space-time. Uh, when there are molecules of water, there is no water. So same way, when there are atoms of space-time, there is no space-time. How can I then talk of elementary particles living in space-time when space-time itself is not there? The universe is fundamentally made up of atoms of space-time matter and the unification of quantum mechanics with gravitation, the quantum gravity and the other forces takes place in the realm of atoms of space-time matter. When many of these atoms of space-time matter get entangled, uh, large objects are formed in space-time and gravitation emerge. So we now have some understanding of Paddy's uh, uh, 
mission that uh, we are mathematically able to define these atoms of space time matter. And uh, when many of those atoms get entangled with each other, then they form large objects and then gravitation emerges. So Paddy asked this question, what are those atoms? So we have some mathematical understanding of that, but uh, we will not talk about it today. We realize that quantum theory is also an emergent phenomenon. Gravitation, as Paddy shows, and quantum theory, both are emergent phenomena. Uh, that is, for example, showed in this picture, uh, if you take Paddy's book as the describing gravitation, and here is the work of uh, Princeton physicist Stephen Adler from a few years ago showing that quantum theory is also an emergent phenomenon, which means they are both coming out from some deeper theory. And this is what I work on. I gave it a name called the Icon theory and trying to respect Paddy's discovery and Adler's discovery and show how both gravitation and quantum theory emerge. So this, this is our story for today. I will uh, uh, summarize and then I'll leave you with a, a video of Padmanabhan himself. So what is gravitation? Gravity was discovered to explain the motion of planets. Then in Einstein's work, gravity became curvature of space-time. Then in Paddy's work, it became thermodynamics. Padmanabhan's research has left a permanent mark on our understanding of gravitation. Any future theory of quantum gravity must imply and prove the thermodynamic nature of gravity. You cannot escape Padmanabhan, you see. Whatever you do in the future with gravity, you have to obey what he has shown. So what does gravitation emerge from? Recent research suggests that the precursor of gravity is the right-handed counterpart of the strong force, weak force, and electromagnetism. It seems now that gravity is a little bit like the strong force. It's a little bit like the weak force. It's also a little bit like uh, electromagnetism. So this is the next step after uh, Padmanabhan. We are beginning to understand the nature and behavior of those uh, underlying atoms of space-time matter. Our quest to understand this most enigmatic force of gravitation is not yet over, but perhaps, perhaps now nearing completion. Uh, it's a pity. And he's not here to see this, but you know, that is life. But uh, I would now end my talk with a seven minutes or so long video recording of Professor Padmanavan, where in his own words in this uh, interview, 2015, he talks to us, he explains to us what are the atoms of space time. So please listen to him for about seven minutes and with that we will end the talk there will be nothing more to say after this what we see as space time in my mind is and there is a lot of evidence for it is made of something like what i would call the atoms of space so technically you would call it microscopic degrees of freedom let us go back to again a couple of centuries and suppose i give you a glass of water and you want to know what it is made of. You might have thought that the water is made of atoms. This is complete nonsense. You don't need that. If I give you a glass of water, and if you are as clever as Boltzmann, the Austrian physicist, you could have said that it is made of atoms because you can heat water. When you are heating water, you are putting energy into water, and the water must have a way of storing this energy. If it does not have this way of storing energy, it cannot exhibit heat phenomenon or thermal phenomenon. So the very fact that matter exhibits thermal phenomena tells you that matter is made of atoms. Again, I'm going to use the word atoms when I mean microscopic degrees of freedom. Okay, so it is made of atoms. In the same way, we now understand that space or better still space-time exhibits thermal phenomena. 
it has temperature and it has another quantity called the entropy. Roughly speaking, entropy refers to the level of disorder in a system. And for uh, normal material, the temperature multiplied by entropy gives you the amount of heat content. This room, at this place, at this point, the space-time has a temperature. I'm not talking about the temperature of this atmosphere or the gas. The space-time here has a temperature for certain observers. This was first shown in the context of black holes. <clears throat> so people thought that black holes are some esoteric objects and uh, they have a temperature and they have an entropy and they thought it is a very special kind of a thing. But very soon, and this, result, this is the celebrated result of Stephen Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein. Now, very soon, uh, just a couple of years after that, two gentlemen, Paul Davis and Bill Andrew, showed that the result is much more general. And I consider that to be the most beautiful result which we have in putting principles of quantum mechanics and gravity. What it tells you is that if you have an observer who cannot see beyond a particular region, it is like you are standing at a seashore and there is a horizon beyond which you cannot see. And so that is region of space becomes inaccessible to the observer. Now, if something is inaccessible, you lack information about that region. The concept of entropy in thermodynamics, what I call the disorder. What does disorder mean? Disorder means that you can, it is not ordered, which means that you do not have precise information about it. If you have a street and the houses are ordered, one, two, three, like that, then you have precise information as to where the number eight house is located. But suppose, imagine a street in which the numbers are completely disordered. There are cities like that. Okay, And then if you want to go to the number eight house, you have to check each house. So the disorder immediately implies lack of information. And lack of information and disorder and entropy are closely connected. So the moment an observer does not have information, he will attribute certain amount of entropy to that horizon. Now, if you take space and you postulate that there are atoms of space because space can be hot and it can have entropy and it can have temperature, then the next question to ask is, can you do better? Now, it turns out that you can do vastly better. First of all, you can reformulate the entire theory of gravity because Einstein's equation, the way Einstein wrote it down, is geometrical. It, it sort of deals with geometrical variables of the space and time. But if gravity is thermodynamic, you should be able to write down the same equations in completely thermodynamic language. If in a particular region in space, I'm talking about normal three-dimensional region in space here, and uh, let's take this region. There is a three-dimensional region bounded by a two-dimensional surface. If there is some amount of gravitating energy inside this region, and there is some amount of degrees of freedom on the surface, it turns out that if nothing is changing with time, the number of degrees of freedom, or rather the number of atoms of space on the surface, and the number of normal atoms which is inside, which is providing the gravity, has to be equal. So this is a remarkable result because it, first of all, connects properties of a bulk region with the properties of the surface. This goes under the name holography. Then you can go and ask, what if these are not equal? Suppose the number of atoms of space on the surface and the number of atoms of matter in the bulk are not equal. Then things cannot be static. The geometry there starts evolving. It sort of, it gets either heated up or cooled down. And you can write down an equation for that. What is remarkable is that this equation turned out to be identical to Einstein's equation. So you can reformulate entire Einstein's theory in completely thermodynamic uh, terms. And you can think in terms of time development of a space time as heating or cooling of the microscopic degrees of freedom. Any good theory should tell you something new. And this theory does. It actually solves what many people consider to be a very important problem in theoretical physics, namely the cosmological constant. So the cosmological constant is, is a term in Einstein's equation which can drive the universe, exp make the universe expand with acceleration. Now, where does this cosmological constant come from? 
it is fundamentally linked to the number of underlying degrees of freedom in the universe. That is what fixes the value of the cosmological constant. So it gives you, in some sense, a quantum gravitational explanation for the cosmological constant and gives its numerical value. There could be different phases of, uh, just like you have different phases of matter, like ice, water, and water vapor, the atoms of space can also reconfigure themselves in different phases. And so far, we have seen only one equilibrium phase in the universe. All our cosmological observations span up to some length scale, and the evidence is consistent with it being described by Einstein's theory. But that does not mean that there are there is no other phase outside. And that is where I think another test, of, almost all the tests of this approach to quantum gravity is going to be cosmological. Because that is the only place where we can and I, I believe that is the right way to investigate this. Taking this course on uh, general relativity and cosmology. So this is going to be a 30 contact hour course. And you always have a bit of a, pro a problem with a seven minute video over. A problem with guest faculty because we just dash in, give the course, and go out. So, I want to first set up a series of rules regarding the contact because if you want to. Sorry, that overshot a bit. The talk is over now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Singh. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, I would request Dr. Manavindana Bera to. to to look up the chat boxes and if there is a question please place it before Professor C. Uh, okay uh, first of all thank you very much for this wonderful and lucid talk. Uh, so I would also request uh, Mr. George to assist me in, in sorting out the questions. So maybe I go one by one some of the questions. So what I see from the chat box many of the questions are associated with black hole. For example why does, uh, for example, just give me a moment, uh, that what happened to black hole, for example, uh, so for example, let's say, if the black hole does not let light escape, does that mean when approaching a black hole, the speed of light changes? So this is one question. No. Uh, uh, so should I answer this first? Yeah. So maybe a couple of more questions I add up and then you come to uh, to answer. Mm -hmm. So another question is how are black holes are natural consequences of, of general theory of relativity? This is another question. Uh, and then how does uh, black hole get that much of powerful gravity? This is the third question. Then uh, if nothing can escape from black hole, why black hole emit radiation, which we call Hawking radiation? Right. So let's say you combine all these questions and if you kindly yeah. answer together. So uh, thank you. This is a very, very good set of questions. Let me try to answer them. Light always moves with the same speed, whatever it is, 300,000 kilometers per second. The beauty of gravitation, of Einstein's gravitation is, even if you keep moving, you don't get anywhere if you are inside a black hole. That is the property of uh, gravitation that everything is turned inwards. You, you are standing, suppose you are able to stand at a point inside the black hole and shine a beam of light outwards that outward shining beam also turns inwards. This is the beauty of gravitation, that you may move at the speed of light, but still gravity does not let you uh, escape. So that was one uh, question. Uh, then I believe uh, there was a question about if, uh, where does the black hole get its strong gravity from? Um, I can only answer this question perhaps in a little bit in a mathematical way. There are two important quantities, the mass of the black hole and the 
radius of the black hole. If for a given radius you put in more and more mass, there comes a stage where gravity becomes so strong that uh, the limiting case is reached that even light cannot escape. Or if you keep the mass fixed and you make the radius smaller, then also you can reach that uh, limiting state. So it's a question really of the relative Im importance of how much mass is there and how much uh, size the black hole is. It's not that black holes are small. There are supermassive black holes which are very, very huge. But then they also have a lot of mass inside them. If you put sufficiently much mass inside a region, it will become a black hole. Now, uh, let's come to the quantum mechanical part of it. Uh, let me try to give you a very important and general picture. Forget about stars for a moment. Forget about stars or planets. They are all going to become black holes one day. Everything is on the way to becoming a black hole. So I say there are only two fundamental kinds of objects in nature. One is elementary particles like electrons and quarks, and the other are black holes. These are two limiting cases. A part, elementary particle has charge, spin, and mass. A black hole also has a charge, spin, and mass. They are very, very similar in some way. The important difference is there are two length scales, uh, the quantum length scale and the classical length scale. I won't give you the maths of it. If the quantum length scale dominates, it behaves like an elementary particle. If the classical length scale is larger, it behaves like a black hole. So think of black holes and elementary particles as the opposite limits of each other. Now, so if a black hole is black, why does it give out a radiation called Hawking radiation? A classical black hole is black. If you do not apply the laws of quantum mechanics, a black hole is black. But if you were to apply the laws of quantum mechanics to the particles inside the black hole, then you know a fact that black hole, that particles in quantum mechanics, particles actually behave like waves. Those waves whose wavelength is larger than the size of the black hole, they escape. These escaping uh, quanta or waves is what gives a black hole a temperature in which the Hawking radiation is a result of the escape of long wavelength particles from the black hole. If you treat black holes quantum mechanically, that is why they cannot be exactly black. Did I miss out anything from this list? No, it, 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 it more or less covers the question that I had asked mm -hmm. uh, essentially. Uh, so one question, uh, so uh, let me also point out there are some questions, uh, they are too technical and maybe we will leave out given that the audience we have is mixed. Uh, Actually, I, uh, I see a lot of questions even here in the WebEx so, chat. If these don't get un un answered, please write to me. I would like exactly. to answer your questions. Just sure. email me. I can see these questions are very important. I yes. want to do this to them just email me i'm telling the students just send me an email uh, i give you my email address here uh, just okay. email me your question and i please go ahead yes so uh, still uh, we will pick up some of the questions so you have mentioned at some point that your uh, gravity can be connected to thermodynamics so i receive we receive one question it says that I too thought if the gravity can be expressed in terms of thermodynamics, do they follow any rules of statistical mechanics? If so, which statistical mechanics do they obey? Ah, very good question. Very good question. Yes. If a black hole is thermodynamic, it must be made of atoms of space-time or space-time matter. 
when you take a lot of those atoms together, you can describe them by statistical mechanics as, as in normal textbook statistical mechanics, nothing different. Boltzmann's law, you know, entropy is K log omega, where omega is the number of uh, uh, microstates. Just use those laws and we are supposed to be able to derive gravitational entropy, including black hole entropy, by applying the usual laws of statistical mechanics to these atoms of space-time matter. Some progress has been made. Physicists have put in a lot of effort trying to understand how to derive black hole entropy and gravitational entropy, starting from these underlying atoms of space-time and by applying statistical mechanics to it. Um, hard to say that this problem is completely solved. For that, we must first have a quantum theory of gravity. I would say that currently good progress is being made in that direction. Okay, thank you. So the next question, question, also in this. Yes, please, uh, Mr. George, please go ahead. How is dark in a, dark matter and energy different from every kind of matter known to humans? Do they obey gravity as well? Ah, uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so let us first uh, take two minutes to say what is this talk of dark matter and dark energy? Let us focus like Galileo and Kepler on the experiment and the observation. What we have seen that in our solar neighborhood and near compact objects like stars and neutron stars, laws of Newtonian gravitation and Einstein's law of general relativity holds. We have tested Newton and Einstein in and around the solar system and in the nearby part of our galaxy. When we look at stars which are very far away in the outer parts of the galaxy, they are also going around the center of the galaxy. By applying Newton's law of gravitation, you can try to calculate what is the speed at which they should go around, the rotation velocity. Turns out these stars are going much faster than Newtonian gravitation could predict. So we have a problem. The motion of stars in the outer regions of galaxies does not agree with Newton's law of gravitation. This can mean two things. Either Newton's law of gravitation does not apply there, and since Newton's laws are a special case of general relativity, Einstein gravity also does not apply on such large scales. That's one possibility. Or there is matter which is not shining, which we call dark matter. If you put more matter there, that can explain, the additional matter can explain uh, why those stars are going faster. That is uh, the hypothesis of dark matter. Now comes a big question. Is it that there is dark matter and Newton's law is correct? Or is it that there is no dark matter and Newton's law of gravitation should be modified? I, this is an open question. Same for dark energy. Where did this concept of dark energy come from? According to Einstein's law of gravitation, the expansion of the universe should be slowing down. For the same reason, if you throw a ball up, it slows down. Gravity pulls it back, it slows down. For the same reason, the expanding universe should be slowing down. Instead, we see it is accelerating. Now, is it because Einstein's law of gravitation is not applying there? Or is it because there is something we call dark energy which makes the universe accelerate instead of slow down? This is also an unsolved problem. So your question is very good. Are the laws of Newton and Einstein applicable at large distances or not? We don't know the answer, but the beauty is 
that Padmanabhan's conclusion that gravity is a thermodynamic phenomenon is so general that it will apply also to theories which may replace Newtonian gravitation and Einstein's general. So that result is very strong. Paddy's result is very strong. Uh, but uh, whether there is dark matter and dark energy or modified gravity, I think it is an open issue. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. George. Uh, is there some more question from your end? Uh, can we say that uh, space-time fabric is elastic? If it is elastic, then can we say that collapse of a star is breaking up the space-time fabric by passing the elastic limit of the fabric? Thus creating a black hole. That is correct. On sufficiently large scales, space uh, is getting stretched. That is why the universe is expanding and things are, when we say universe is expanding, space is getting stretched. And you are right, on smaller scales, like the scale of stars, the star is breaking away from the stretched elastic fabric and collapsing under its own weight, say, to form a black hole. So there is a competition. There is one kind of force which is stretching space-time, another gravitational force which is causing objects to decouple from the stretching and shrink, which is why I feel that Einstein's gravitation is not the last word on our understanding of gravitation. So in the last part of my talk, I tried to talk of this precursor of gravity, which seems to suggest that Einstein's law of gravitation will also be generalized. So Newton, Einstein, Paddy, and then beyond. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so shall I pick up, uh, uh, I don't know how much time I have, uh, Professor Banerjee, can I pick up, let's say, a couple of more questions? We'd yeah. like to end another, you know, uh, three, four minutes. So one more, one or two more questions, that's all. Yes. The rest, okay. please email yes. me. Email me the question. Yes. Yes. So some of the questions, or many questions, possibly that will uh, not be uh, considered today because of the constraint we have on time. So in that case, kindly write to Professor uh, T P Singh directly. The email is there on the chat box. So I go for the next question. That if particles are embedded in space time and space-time emergent angle, does it explain the gravity in a round manner? So I hope the question is clear, not very clear to me. So it is a... Yeah, my link is and not and good. My link is breaking. It's, 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 breaking. it's an emergent phenomenon. I, th I think Dr. Bera's uh, link was a bit sloppy. So shall so I repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah, please repeat the question. Repeat the question. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm repeating. If particles are embedded in space-time and space-time are emergent phenomena due to entanglement, so whether explaining gravity and entanglement is like a cyclic argument or something like that, how they are related? Ah, oh, beautiful. The question very, clear? very, very good. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Very good question. So. Uh, it is like uh, this. Uh, let me try to put it in a summary and then explain. Uh, entanglement causes collapse of the wave function of material bodies. Space-time is the result of collapse of the wave function of material bodies. And space-time, when I say space-time, I also mean gravity. See, a quantum particle does spread everywhere their gravity is also spread everywhere. The, the pre-gravity is there. Something called pre-gravity or precursor of gravity is there in the quantum world, but it is not gravity. It is a precursor of gravity, the atoms of space-time, as Paddy says. When many elementary particles or fermions get entangled with each other, once the entanglement crosses a certain limit, enough particles are entangled, their wave function collapses to form classical 
localized bodies. Once classical localized bodies are formed, space emerges between them. The space is that which is between classical bodies. Time is that which is between classical events. For space-time and gravity to emerge, first classical bodies must form, and classical bodies form when critical entanglement is reached. So in, gravity and space-time are a consequence of quantum entanglement. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, clear explanation. So I will go for the last question. Uh, and that is essentially coming from like a common, uh, the question will appear in a common mind, is that most of the cases when you talk about space and time in the classical picture, what it means, uh, space means like the area or the volume will be occupied by some material entity and the time is essentially that how this material entity changes over time, it, it indicates the rate of evolution and so on and so forth. So from starting from this notion of space and time, and going to relativity or more so, let's say the post-relativistic understanding of space-time, if I compare, how different are they? Because oh. it seems in relativity, like space-time is there independent of any existence of material entity. We, we, we kind of disentangle it uh, yes. from, from the that's presence of matter. That's so how very... do you understand? Hmm. Um, I would put it that space-time and matter can only be understood and talked of with respect to each other. In a quantum theory of gravity where matter is all quantum, I make no distinction between matter and space-time. I only talk of space-time matter, atoms of space-time matter. When bodies become classical, space-time decouples from matter. They both have their own uh, identity, but again we can meaningfully talk of them only with respect to each other. Let us not give space and time an absolute status. Anything which is emergent cannot be absolute. It uh, is a derived notion. So matter as well as space-time, in my opinion, my understanding, are both derived notions. What is the most fundamental thing is these so-called atoms of space-time matter, which if I may add my little bit of own work, is that these so-called atoms of space-time matter are described by a number system known as the octonions, which are the generalization of real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, and octonions. At this level of description, there is no distinction between physical bodies and the mathematics which describes them. So I can make a statement, atoms of space-time matter are octonions. It looks very surprising, but in a way satisfying also at this deepest level, mathematics and number theory makes contact with physics in such an intimate way, it is very hard to say where mathematics ends and physics begins. So my, my picture is the, it is not just that the physical world is described by mathematics, the physical world is mathematics. It looks different. The, the it, bottle doesn't look like an equation. But if you look deep down at the most fundamental level, you will find that the atoms of space-time matter, the only way to talk of them is to define them mathematically. I hope you get the picture. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, for this, uh, I thank uh, Professor T.P. Singh as well as the people who pose the questions for this interactive discussion. And with this, we are closing this question and session. And now I will hand over the program to uh, Professor Swamitra Banerjee. Over to you, Professor Banerjee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manavindranath Bera. And uh, it is my turn to thank Professor T.P. Singh for such a illuminating yeah. and uh, wonderful lecture. In fact, uh, I would say that 
it is a very difficult topic to speak on to a lay audience who are not in that sense trained physicists and you really did an excellent job at that because for Thank many you. of the people who are there in the audience the way they responded the way they commented i could see that people did understand what you wanted to convey and most importantly uh, professor padmanabhan's own contribution uh, placing it in the background of the existing human knowledge that is uh, through that we we understand the the real importance of the contribution of uh, that great man and that has been achieved i suppose the audience has been able to understand the importance of uh, professor padmanabhan's work which i believe will be revealed more as we go along yes and initially uh, mr george joseph has outlined that uh, professor padmanabhan was not only active in hard research but he was also very active in getting that research reach the common people and he really took it seriously i would say emotionally and uh, these are the things we have to learn from i believe yes. we have to learn from the way professor padmanabhan took the whole of science as mm. an emotional pursuit both in yeah. terms of scientific yes. uh, scientific research as well as i mean we have seen people who are doing excellent scientific research but they are cocooned inside the laboratory they don't reach out to the people because padmanabhan was not of that sort he believed that it is necessary for uh, science to reach the common man the common everything every equation the common man may not understand but they have to understand the essence the thought process that is what he what he wanted to convey to the common people yes. and uh, yeah i would uh, hope that the audience today would learn from that and would like to emulate that in their own lives with that i'd like to end this uh, wonderful session i we could have extended it but you know every good thing has a has to come to an end at some point of time so uh, let us thank again professor tp singh and let's finish i also uh, thank the audience for being there and uh, Yes, we are finished, finishing this talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.